When I made it to my home place, I found triumph of the will. Where once lay a shining city, stood a fortress on a hill. This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, Giovanni, Shiloh, and Manisha. Well, welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you for being with us today. I'm here with the lovely Suzanne Gordon of the Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute to discuss um, a recent report uh, that you wrote about the Veterans Health Administration and uh, rural health care. Um, Suzanne, welcome to Fortress on the Hill. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be uh, chatting with you today. So, um, why don't you give us a short rundown on, on the report and what, uh, why it's so important. So as I've been tracking, um, and Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute, the HPI has been tracking a variety of bills in Congress that are essentially dedicated to privatizing the VA, the Veterans Health Administration, which is the largest healthcare system in the country, the only publicly funded, fully integrated, comprehensive healthcare system in the country, one who that delivers care that I think we should all be able to uh, enjoy, not just veterans. Um, I've been covered, uh, covered the VA, write about the VA, wrote a book about it called Wounds of War. And increasingly, there has have been efforts that are successful to privatize the VA and outsource more care to the private sector. This this effort began with the Choice Program in 2014, which started. It was supposed to be a temporary program. It was an effort of John McCain, who was then alive, and the Republican senator from Arizona, and Bernie Sanders from Vermont. It was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to give the VA more money for staffing, but it opened the door to privatization by allowing veterans to go to private sector providers at the VA's expense if they lived more than 40 miles from a VA facility or um, had to wait more than 30 days for an appointment. What was supposed to be temporary, um, McCain turned around and and, and basically um, lied to Sanders and said, oh, no, I want this to be permanent. And that then led to this VA Mission Act of 2018, which started this program called the Veterans Community Care Program, which is essentially a parallel private sector provider network of, you know, millions of providers that millions of veterans are being shunted to. And this whole privatization movement has been justified, I began to realize, by suggesting or promising that it was going to solve the problem of rural veterans. And so rural veterans who represent 25% of the veteran population, um, they became the wedge or the ramp has, has been used, the justification to privatize the system um, and, and really demolished the system. And it became increasingly clear to me that we, as a think tank at BHPI, needed to look into what is the situation of rural veterans and do the assumptions and promises that these people who favor VA privatization and outsourcing make, um, are the promises fulfilled and are the assumptions correct? And so that led me and my colleagues to really delve into the problem of rural veterans healthcare, which you, which ha is embedded in, and you can't understand if you don't understand the larger rural healthcare crisis that has been ongoing Amer in the United States for quite some time and was really worsened following um, the COVID pandemic. Let's take a minute before we uh, move further and talk a little bit about what you mentioned about the rural crisis, how it affects the average American, not just the veteran American. So in our report, um, 
I say that um, basically these Congress people, and, and it, it might be you know important to stop for a minute and say that it's very interesting that if you look at the composition of the House and Senate's Veterans Affairs Committee or Committee on Veterans Affairs, um, that in the Senate, there are 17 members, and out of the 17 members, 14 represent rural and highly, highly rural states, including Jerry Moran of Kansas, who's the Republican ranking member of the Senate Committee, and John Tester, who's the chairman, who's from Montana, which is a very, very rural state. And, you know, um, so 12 of the other people on the committee also represent rural states. And that's really interesting because um, there's only 25% of veterans that are rural and you have like the vast majority of the folks on the Senate committee um, uh, being from rural states or, or states that have a lot of rural areas. And, um, and then when you look at the House committee, about 50% of the Congress people represent districts that are rural. So that's kind of interesting, right? So there's this preoccupation with the problems of rural veterans. But now the problems of rural veterans are significant. But as we said, um, you know, they can't be extracted from the problems of rural, other rural Americans. And, and you know, the, the assumptions that have guided um, the assumptions that have guided people like Tester and Marina, and you hear it in their speeches, you know, and that and and these assumptions, by the way, are being promoted by hard right groups like Concerned Veterans for America, which is this phony veteran service organization that's funded by the Koch brothers. So um, basically, they're telling rural veterans that. You know, if we pass these outsourcing bills and we pay for you to go to the private sector, that um, they tell you, first of all, that the problems that you have accessing health care in rural America as a rural veteran are, are not, have nothing to do with the lack of services in rural America, but rather have to do with the fact that you, rural veteran, you know, in Montana or Kansas or wherever, you just are entrapped in the VA and you lack the choices of your neighbors and your family members who aren't veterans. And, you know, you just have don't, you're, you don't have enough choices. And if the VA just paid for you to go to, you know, the, your nearest rural provider or hospital, you'd be just fine. That's assumption number one. So, Based on that, you know, they're also telling people that there are enough conveniently located, and that's big, conveniently located in rural America where distances are, you know, enormous. You will be able to find around the corner, practically. I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit for effect, but you'll be able to find conveniently located hospitals and primary care providers and, you know, cancer specialists and folks to do your heart valve in place within all of that right there in rural America. Isn't that great? And they'll be able to, you know, subs give you mental health care and deal with your substance abuse disorders, et cetera, and give you high quality care and, you know, just go out of the VA and all will be well. Then, you know, they also base their, you know, proposals of outsourcing on this assumption that rural healthcare providers, to the extent there are any, you know, will accept the payment rates of the VA, which is essentially Medicare rates or even any insurance payment, right? And finally, you know, that if all these rural veterans uh, go outside of the VA and get care in the private sector, don't use the VA, not to worry, the VA will still be there as this giant federally funded security blanket for you in 20 years when you finally decide you need it or you lose your, you know, whatever. Um, and so these are these are the um, assumptions. And the only way, of course, you can show that these assumptions are wrong is if you look at the situation of healthcare in rural America. And what you find is 
as any rural America can tell you, not a pretty picture, right? Um, you have huge shortages of providers. Um, you have um, uh, providers who won't accept insurance because they can. You have hospitals closing in rural America. I mean, let me just give you a, a brief picture. So um, Veterans Health, Veterans Health as, as all of us, depends on having enough primary care providers to take care of you, to refer you to a specialist provider, right? Veterans, 50% of them or more have mental health conditions. Uh, so you need mental health providers. A lot of veterans have substance abuse, substance use disorder problems. So you need, you know, clinics and programs in rural America to deliver those. Um, and then, of course, you need emergency rooms and which are in hospitals. You can't have an emergency room if you don't have an ICU and a, and a, and a hospital. Like, there's no such thing as like a freestanding ER. There's urgent care, right? But not ERs. Well, if you look at rural America, which I did, and a lot of people have done, I mean, this is not news, you know. Rural America is a disaster from the point of view of healthcare. Um, it has um, 70% of, um, uh, let's just look at mental health care. And, and, you know, we should sort of define rural, Henry, because, you know, rural, I mean, the, the reality is rural and highly rural are far away from urban areas. So by definition, if you live in rural America and you choose to live in rural America, because you want to get away from people, some of those people that you want to get away from will be doctors and nurses and pharmacists and oncologists and cardiologists and orthopedists, right? Um, and if you want to live in a sparsely populated area, then um, just as you have to drive to a Walmart or a movie theater or even a pharmacy, you're going to have to drive to a healthcare provider. And increasingly, that drive will take you out of rural America and into suburban and urban America because there's nobody there in urban America, in rural America, to take care of you. So let's just look at um, primary care. There's a... a I would really recommend to your listeners um, a website called the Rural Health Information Hub. And it has these amazing maps of what are called healthcare professional shortage areas. And these are clearly defined areas where there are shortages of professionals. And it's absolutely horrifying to look when you look at primary care mental health care and dental care at the map of America, which the Rural Health Information Hub, and thank you so much to them, has, has created these maps where in a very dark blue, every county in, in the country is listed, um, whether it as a, I mean, there are severe shortage areas and then shortage areas and then no shortages. And if you look at the map, most of the country is this deep blue, talk about blue, blue state America. Most of America, when it comes to mental health care, primary care, and um, dental care, is a desert. There's occasionally a kind of um, lighter shade of deep blue, and then there's very sporadically, mostly in urban areas, this kind of light blue that is no shortage. When you go to the Rural Health Information Hub and you look at state by state, and it's such a great resource, you know, because you can take your state, like Kansas, which we did in the report, where Jerry Moran is telling folks, oh, you know, go to rural, go to private sector providers in rural areas and you'll be fine. Um, what you find is complete disaster in primary care and mental health care, which are the, the, the things veterans need, right? And um, then you have um, 
hospitals, right? They tell you, you can go to your rural hospital. The situation is so dire between, um, between, uh, I think it was 2000 and 2009, more and more rural hospitals have closed. And <clears throat> data from the Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform says that 150 rural hospitals closed between 2005 and 2019. During the pandemic, another 20 shuttered. And now, in large part during the pandemic, another 600 are at risk of closure. It's the wonderful new publication called Barn Raiser. The Barn Raiser did a story about the dire situation of hospital closures in rural America. And so when the hospital closes, then ER closes. So you, you know, you hurt yourself. You don't need to go to the city. You could just go to the ER, but there ain't no ER. So you kind of have a, a problem that a, a rural hospital could deal with, right? You have a heart attack, a minor heart attack. You get a terrible injury that, that could be repaired in a, in a small community hospital, but there are none. And so these private equity firms have created these air ambulances and they are now sending patients via air ambulance, often out of state even, um, head to the tune of 50 grand or whatever, because there's no place for people to be taken care of. Um, this article came out after the publication of our report. So, I mean, where on earth are you going to find the gear in rural America, you know? Um, and that, if you look at, we honed in on, on two states in particular, then I think it's worth um, talking about those states. We took, honed in on Montana because of Tester. Uh, John Tester, who has promoted this bill that is now running to the Senate that would outsource more care, doing mental health care, um, to um, uh, private sector providers. And Jerry Moran, who really, in Kansas, who just really wants to kill the VA, you know, he claims to be a friend of veterans. And I don't know how anybody can believe that because he wants to kill the health care system that is absolutely indispensable to veterans and should be expanded, in my view, not dismantled. So we looked at Montana and, um, and Kansas and to try to, to think about, you know, um, where is the care there? Because these guys, these guys should know this. I mean, if I know this, if I could go on Google and find this out in three hours, they live there, right? How could they not know this, right? Um, well, in Montana, for example, it's, it's a state with a million people spread out under 150,000 square miles. Guess how many psychologists there are in the state of Montana to serve 150 psychologists in Montana. Most of them are in urban areas. A lot of them won't take any insurance whatsoever. So the idea that they would take, you know, VA rates of payment to this, you know, community care program is laughable, right? There are um, 100 licensed psychologists, psychiatrists in Montana. Um, the um, Health, Health Resources Services Administration has said that, you know, they need 170 more to meet demand and the the expectation is that rather than increasing um you know by over over 50 percent the number of psychiatrists in montana will decrease um in just a few years by 30 percent so where senator tester are your veterans with mental health problems gonna get care well and then when you look at substance use care there's hardly anything in these places at all. When it comes to primary care in Montana, Montana has 56 counties. 53 of them have shortages of primary care providers. And of the 55 rural hospitals in Montana, 64% of lost services, 25% are at risk of closing. 
and 7% are at risk of immediate closure. So what does that tell you? I mean, what does that tell you about private sector care in Montana, you know? And you're recommending, Senator Jester, that you send veterans who have good services that could, by the way, be expanded by the VA. You're telling them that the VA should be defunded to pay for non-existent care. So what you're doing is you're saying that they're going to have to go to the cities because there ain't no care near there. And then to pay for lower quality care at higher cost, defunding the VA further, there will be closures of facilities in rural areas and you will be out of luck is the, is the lesson. If you look at Kansas, you see the same thing, you know, Jerry Moran's Kansas. I mean, he apparently doesn't listen to the news, right? Because, you know, they're in for the one you know, 3 million Montana residents, a million of them live in rural areas. There are about 190,000 uh, veterans living in Kansas, but there's only 314 licensed psychologists and 300 psychiatrists to serve the 3 million residents. So there really is pretty much the same situation as in Montana. Um, you know, the news reports in Montana that I guess Moran and his staff don't listen to show that, you know, money psychiatrists in the state are aging um, and um, they have a very poor ratio of psychiatrists to, you know, 100,000 population there. And again, these psychiatrists and psychologists don't take, many of them don't take insurance because if you're in high demand, right, in a state, um, where there's high demand, why would you take insurance when, you know, you could find enough rich patients to pay you $325 an hour? Why would you take Medicare rates or insurance rates, right? I mean, unless you're a VA psychologist and you are mission rather than profit driven. And again, you know, we tend to see the same thing in, um, in Kansas with, with uh, primary care shortages, um, uh, we have 105 counties in Kansas. Um, only nine don't have a shortage of primary care providers. And, you know, we have 104 rural hospitals, 83% of lost services, 58% are at risk of closing, and 28% are at risk of immediate closure. And so it, it boggles the mind, you know, to... I mean, either they're ignorant or they're on the take. But whichever one of those you choose is not good. Um, and I think it's probably a little bit of both, certainly for Moran. Um, but it's very tragic because, as you know, as a veteran, and you lived in a rural area, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what was there for you? Um. I haven't lived there in, in quite a while now, but while I was living there, they had a, um, they actually had up a, a VA clinic there in my, my little hometown. And that clinic serviced so many other outlying areas in and around it. We also had a veteran's home that sits just, on, it's almost on the same campus um, next to the clinic. And so that also meant that everybody that was there and was going to utilize the VA for healthcare actually had an option. Prior to that, um, I'm trying to remember when the clinic opened, maybe 2013, 2014, something like that. It was all Portland. Portland was the ending, the only, the only shot we had at it. Um, they had a clinic further to the, further, closer to my own town that wasn't quite all the way into Portland, but it was close. Um, but no, it's, it, it, it's, uh, uh, I know that I, looking my home county on one of the maps from your report that uh, we're low on primary care and also low on psychologists, psychiatrists, those uh, those kind of things. Aside from that, aside from the VA, that everybody else had to go to pretty expensive private care in the surrounding community. I remembered what it was. And I, I, I first learned about some of this when I was looking for a psychiatrist in my hometown in the Dalles, and the vast majority of them 
don't take, if they took, if they took any insurance, it was the best ones. They wouldn't take Medicare. They wouldn't take VA payments. And I didn't realize up until recently that it was probably because they, of the, that they didn't, they didn't pay enough, that they weren't willing to do it as opposed to it being something that you accept smaller payments, knowing that you're helping people who don't have the means or veterans or whatever that happens to look like. But that means that in, in those places that your actual choice of finding a shrink or a primary care doctor that you feel comfortable with is that much less because a certain, a certain echelon of them up high won't take those kind of insurance rates. I find it kind of distressing because if you won't take insurance, let's say you charge 325 an hour, which is actually low, right? So 325, if you said see 10 patients a week at 325 an hour, you know, that's $3,250 a week you're making. If you multiply that times, let's just say 50, you know, that's $160,000 a year. That's not so bad. And they probably see more than 10 patients a week. So if you see 20 patients a week, you know, that's almost $400,000 a year. Um, I mean, nobody, why do these people have to earn $400,000 a year? I mean, they could do very well on 250, you know? Um, it, it's, it's kind of, I think, the greed that is now in modern medicine. I mean, some of these doctors now, these primary care doctors are going into concierge care, they're making a couple million dollars a year. And, you know, I think if you want to make that much money, go be a stockbroker. There's lots of things you could do. You know, it could be a corporate lawyer and charge $750 an hour. I mean, um, but I think that um, the reality is that in rural America, by virtue of the fact that you're far away from things and that, and that you live in a very sparsely populated area, there are many reasons why there are shortages of providers, right? And, you know, one of the things we look at, <clears throat> or I looked at in the report, is why do we have this rural health crisis, right? I mean, and because why can't you find a provider? Well, for specialty care, highly, spe highly specialized health care, you know, like total knee operations or, you know, I don't know, certain kinds of, of specialty care, you always will have to go to an urban area because you don't have the population to support the maintenance of skills in, in these doctors, nurses, and teams. And um, I think veterans... And a lot of people just don't understand this. They don't understand that you are not going to be able to get a coronary artery bypass graft after a heart attack in a sparsely populated rural area. Because if you only have 10,000 people living there, you know, I mean, how many of those people every year are going to have that serious heart problem? and need surgery. If you go to a surgeon, you want that surgeon to perform, you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000 operations a year, not 10. I mean, you should not want to be operated on by somebody who's just doing it for the first time, unless, you know, there's no other choice. And, you know, like it's on TV, right? You know, some, I mean, um, you know, it's like the person flying the plane in a terrorist attack or something, you know, or, or the, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. And, you know, you want, you, when you get cataract surgery, you want to go to a cataract mill, right? You do. And um, for many routine problems, yes, you could have them taken care of in a rural practice. But what you need really is you need for many complex things. And Veterans have very complex problems, right? You need pe you need enough people who specialize in that. Like, take mental health. You have PTSD. Most, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists don't know how to treat PTSD, and they certainly don't know how to treat military or combat-related PTSD. 
military sexual trauma. They probably never heard of it. I had a friend who went to a psychologist on this veterans community care program. And this guy had, you know, complex um, PTSD from combat. And the psychologist turned to him and said, I don't understand why you're here. I take care of patients whose, you know, parents got divorced and they were upset. It's incredible, right? Um, and veterans are very particular, often particularly people with PTSD. They really don't feel like anybody can ever understand them. And if they're, you know, subject to a therapist who really doesn't understand them, that's not very helpful. The VA has trained thousands of psychologists and mental health professionals in how to treat PTSD, military sexual trauma. This isn't something you just kind of pick up as you go along. And it's really disrespectful to our veterans as well as to VA professionals to suggest that you don't, that they don't need this kind of expertise and that you don't need to learn it, right? I mean, one of the things I don't think people understand is that these networks that have been set up with providers to take care of veterans, they do not require anything but a medical license. They don't require that there's trainings in suicide prevention, that there's trainings in evidence-based care for PTSD or other problems that, you know, providers understand the difference between burn fit related cancers and, and uh, respiratory problems and a cough, you know. So, and they claim that, oh, if we require these private sector folks to do even two hours of minimal training on a computer, they wouldn't sign up. And this would hurt access. Well, access to shoddy care is not access, you know. And um, obviously the insurance companies that benefit from this and the private sector providers that benefit from this, um, they have no interest in spending time, you know, being trained to receive taxpayer money to take care of people who sacrifice for their country. Um, and it's very disturbing to me, you know. It's it's uh, it's it's both fascinating and and humiliating to think about that the, you know, it it, it, it there are a lot of veterans that take a, a great amount of persuasion and um, family input to go to the doctor, depending on what it is. You know, some folks might be good at going and dealing with physical stuff, but they won't go see a shrink or or vice versa. Um, but again, this person who can't get this, get, uh, the care that they need, um, how long did it take them to convince themselves or for their family to say, there's this very important thing you have wrong and we think we know what to do and, oh, wait, we don't have anywhere. We don't, where are you going to go to attempt to access that care? You know, if it's close to home. You know, it's like, okay, well, close to my house, I might feel a little bit comfortable with it. The further you have to go in order to make that happen adds additional conditions on that, that people who are so used to saying, I, I'm not worried about these things. I'm not worried. You know, I, 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 I might go get my heart looked at every once in a while, but I'm going to not deal with this particular problem. And that's their choice. That's theirs to make. It, make, would, it certainly ends up making families' uh, lives harder and those kind of things. but there should be that kind of availability. Um, and, and you would think that that's something, you know, like people, you know, John Tester has been um, doing Senate work for around veterans, for veterans for, for quite a long time. And I don't disagree with, every, with everything he says. Some things I think that he's, he's on the money about. But again, it, it, if there is just no help, you know, it, it, people will start convincing themselves that it's not worth it because those first steps into something like that are always very tentative. I think the trick is that if you could, I mean, there's always something a couple hours away that the VA provides. Yeah. And then the VA also provides telehealth services and also gives veterans, like if you can't afford an iPad or a laptop or whatever, I mean, there is a broadband problem that Congress needs to deal with. 
And it's outrageous that you go into certain areas in rural America. I mean, you can always find a phone line, but you can't find, you know, broadband and Wi-Fi, which you need for LL. Mm-hmm. But that, and that needs to be solved. And these guys should be on the forefront of that. And I'm not sure they are. Um, they should be on the forefront of producing more primary care doctors in the American healthcare system, which Congress could control by allocating, you know, forcing uh, hospital residency programs to treat, to um, uh, produce more primary care doctors. We could give free medical education and and psychology training and so forth to mental health professionals, and they should be on the forefront of that, and they're not. Um, but I think that this problem for rural veterans, and I I so agree with you, Henry, about um, I, I'm, you know, the resistance that veterans have to getting help. But I think um, it's this kind of macho, you know, the macho mentality, even if you're a woman and also you're in the military, you're discouraged from admitting to these problems because it's weakness and for, um, you know, destroy your chances of promotion, whatever. Um I think that um, it's very important for veterans to encourage each other to get help because you all listen to each other and to say, okay, if you have to drive two hours, drive two hours, you know, but don't get an appointment with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing or don't believe it if, you know, they tell you there's going to be care where there ain't any. And I think also... I mean, I just talked to a primary care provider in a VA that she'll go nameless. And um, this veteran lived in a town that was an hour and 15 minutes from the VA hospital medical center. He wanted to have a heart valve replacement in a hospital near this town with a surgeon who'd never done it before. But it was convenient. And yeah. I mean, they give it's your hard heart. You know what I'm saying? It's not your, you know, stitching up your, your thumb. Uh, and it was very hard to convince him that this was like a really, really bad idea. You know, like, okay, getting a little basal cell cancer removed, that might be okay. Or some extremely routine process. And um, I think they think a surgeon's a surgeon, a surgeon, you know, and I think veterans need to be counseling other veterans against this. Um, there was just a study that came out and a lot of veterans have prostate problems and some get prostate cancer. And there was just a study that came out that if you were a veteran with prostate cancer and you went to the private sector under the Veterans Community Care Program, sorry, Veterans Community Care Program, they were much more likely to not follow the standard of care for watchful waiting when it was indicated and perform surgery that wasn't necessarily necessary at that point. And you don't want a surgical procedure if you don't, um, if it isn't indicated at that moment, because something can go wrong. And I mean, but it makes them money. The VA has no incentive to perform surgeries or do treatments that financially because they're on salary. It's not a fee for service system. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. veterans need to be getting up to speed on some of this and advising each other not only to get help, but okay, Joe, you might have to drive two hours. I mean, the thing for rural Americans that is really important is that they have pathways to specialized care. One of those pathways is telehealth, and the VA is a pioneer in that. But there are some things you have to go in person, and you may have to go four hours, but, you know, the VA will pay for you to go there. They'll pay for your hotel. They'll pay for your transportation. It, that you can be followed up in a local area, right? 
and you can be followed up by telehealth. But you have to maintain and improve the integrity of the system that you have, not tear it down. And I think that's what veterans don't understand. You know, that I think they don't understand that, as I say, if you don't choose VA, you're going to lose VA. Because the taxpayer is not going to pay for two parallel systems for veterans. No. Cannot afford it. You know, and we're not going to pay for a system that veterans don't use. Now, I think when it comes to rural health care, some of these senators and Congress people actually think that they can save their rural hospitals and rural providers and this get a kind of double benefit. You know, it's like a twofer by injecting VA money and patients into those practices and hospitals. The problem is that the payment rates, the, the reason why these rural hospitals and practices are folding is because they don't have enough patients with private insurance payment rates that cover the fact that Medicare um, how, you know, payments don't cover their costs, which are too high anyway. Um, and so if you funnel more VA patients being paid Medicare dollars into these practices and hospitals, it's not going to save them. What could save them or, or could save rural Americans is, as well as rural veterans is using VA financing to expand care, um, expand telehealth, expand, create um, uh, actual real partnerships that don't jeopardize the VA with the surviving rural hospitals, let veterans' family members uh, come to those hospitals and let veterans who are ineligible for VA care because they have a bad paper discharge or because they have, though never proven service-connected disability or their income is too high, let them go into these practices. And the VA has the money or could have more money um, to really expand its rural health capacity and save rural health care for not only veterans, but but for more rural Americans. I mean, the reality is that the private sector, corporate healthcare, private equity firms are never going to invest in rural health care because it is not profit making. The people who live in rural America are by and large old and poor um, and, and sometimes uninsured. And so they're not profitable. You know, they're not profitable patients and they're often complex patients. But the VA, with the power of the federal purse, you know, could invest in healthcare in rural America for veterans and their families. And, you know, that could be a big hit. That could be a very big help. I would, I, I know I've seen the, the, um, and I don't know what program they're involved with, but the, the, um, there's sometimes mobile stops set up with VA yeah, facilities. Mobile, yeah. Mobile facilities. Those could be expanded. Um, so could telehealth, but at some point, sometimes people have to go to the doctor or the hospital. And, oh, yeah. and I mean, you know, you could imagine, I mean, we end the paper, I end the paper with the suggestion that people and BHPI is determined to flesh this out, establish um, pilot programs with rural providers or programs in rural America. I mean, for example, the VA has funding to train mental health providers. Um, and it could train providers specifically for rural America or for, you know, part-time duty in rural America. It can train primary care providers. I mean, particularly if it were given more money, it could do a lot to help the primary and mental health care prices in America. Um, I mean, the VA has an incredible capacity. And, you know, veterans could actually serve as M ambassadors and promoters and advocates for more VA services as post private sector services 
in rural America. I mean, you are now spending 25 to 50% of the VA budget on private sector care. We're talking billions and billions of dollars, you know, up, upwards of 60 potentially, you know, you know, 30 to $60 billion. That's a lot of billion dollars, you know? Um, and so, um, you could get a lot of health care if you took those dollars away from the private sector and in, injected them in the VA. The VA is now going to pay $23.5 billion to contract out health, um, uh, HR, human resources functions, and um, hire temps, you know, in, in VA hospitals. These are people who know nothing about veterans. Yes. $23.5 billion. I mean, you know, there's 20 billion here, 30 billion there, you know, 60 billion there. That's a lot of billions. That could buy you a lot of staff. That could buy you a lot of improvements. It makes it, 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 one of the things I've always appreciated about the VA is that they generally, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, who the veteran is or what they come, what their, their overriding problem is when they come, come there. That if somebody gets like, let's say somebody gets in an argument with one of the staff or they, they, they don't believe in a, in a, a treatment of some, some sort or they don't want a vaccine or whatever, that the staff are really well trained at dealing with those kind of things. And especially, you know, for veterans that after having been in the military and been, you know, told you're going to live in this box for however long, when you leave the box. You want to be able to make those choices for yourself. You want to be able to do those kind of things. Um, and, 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 you know, we don't, like you said, we don't want to force anybody to do it, but if people don't use it, we will end up, it, we will end up losing it. Um, had more to say and I dropped it. Sorry. Um, actually, hold on one second. I have my little transcript thing here. How was this? Oh yeah. So. They're going to be, it's going to become acceptable for the people, a lot of people in a lot of those places, potentially you saying human resources staff, but I bet eventually it end up leading into the lower levels of medical staff and stuff. People that are, you know, it's, it becomes a, a contract thing. One, it doesn't give actual VA jobs to people so they can have those benefits. Um, and also is the, 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 you're bringing in people that are always going to be the new guys. They're always going to be the folks that have maybe dealt with those issues in a non-veteran context outside the VA system, but chances are they haven't. And it takes a while to get into that. But with it's a contract, how do you know who you're ever going to be getting? What kind of, you know, repetition is actually going to come from that? And that means veterans aren't going to be comfortable. And that means fewer of them are going to go to the doctor, which means, you know, closer to losing it in, term, in, those, in those terms. If somebody gets some standard care and there isn't a way to rectify it. Well, and I, I really believe that it's time for us all to start some kind of choose VA, use it or lose it campaign, because I just think that this assumption that I mentioned before, um, that, you know, you can maintain a robust VA and this parallel private sector system. I mean, I am just beginning to do research um, around what's going on in different VAs around the country. And so much money is going out to private sector care that they're, they're um, putting, you know, curtailing programs, they're um, uh, cutting back on promised raises, they're not hiring, they're putting in what they euphemistically refer, refer to as hiring pauses, which are really hiring freezes. And this is going on all over the country. And veterans need to understand this, you know. There's, I mean, and, and you know, we've discussed the problems in rural America. The problems in urban America aren't that much better. I mean, I can't find a, pro, a primary care provider practically in, um, you know, uh, in the Bay Area. I mean, I have one, um, and it's very hard to find one. Uh, I have friends who are primary care providers who can't find a primary care provider to take care of them, you know? Um, there's, 
tremendous wait times. I mean, every time I want to go to the PG, I have to wait three months. You know, my husband needed, you know, an appointment with a urologist. It was five months because of wait, because they are saving their appointments for people who want surgery, you know? And I mean, it's a disaster now. American healthcare is a disaster. I mean, veterans, you know not how you can we explain this to people. You are so lucky. You know, it's just terrifying to me that people think the grass is greener. The, the, there's no grass. It's a desert. It's like you want some cactuses? Great. Come to, you know, the American healthcare system. But it, it's just like, you know, there was this recent study of veterans who had Medicare and and VA in care, so they're called dual eligible, and they could go to a VA ER or a private sector ER. If they went to a private sector ER, they had 46% increased chance of dying in the first 28 days. So I read that and I think, how come my kids go to a VA ER, you know? It's because there's comprehensive coordinated care. And I guess the real, you know, mystery to me is how you reach veterans and get them not to believe these false promises. I mean, I wish you could live yeah. in a frontier area where there's, you know, less than whatever, 2,500 people per wherever square mile. I wish you could live there and get a total knee replacement around the corner. I wish you could. Wouldn't that be lovely? You know, and I also wish that, you know, I could have a billion dollars and, and you know, a house in Hawaii. It just ain't going to happen. And I think that, you know, we are often most critical of that those were closest to us. And so I think there's this kind of griping thing about the VA. And the VA has problems. No question. Of course, the VA has problems. But how do you solve those problems? Do you solve the problems by, you know, it's like you love your wife, but, you know, you kind of are irritated by her or your veteran husband who you're irritated by. Well, do you get rid of the guy or the woman or do you, like, figure it out? You know, now, obviously, there's something times when you really do want to leave. But in this case, this is a great healthcare system. It specializes in veterans' problems. It needs more money. It needs more staff. People should be, you know, I don't know. There's various things that, you know, you can you can improve, clearly, for women veterans. Um, you know, there's problems. But, you know, even on the women veteran front, I mean, what healthcare system is going to design a special program for women veterans everywhere for 7% of the patient population. I mean, if women veterans think they're going to find clinics where they don't see men in the private sector, the only place that can happen is with your gynecologist. You know, I mean, and, and it's just, you know, so I guess the question, I, and I'm fascinated by what you think is, how do you get these veterans to see we have an incredible system? People have spent a lot of money to take care of us and refine our care. We want it to improve. You don't improve it by giving somebody else the money and the time and energy and attention that you need to spend on fixing your system. It, if, if you want your care to improve, I mean, do you think veterans are... 7% of the population with, you know, increasingly fewer, I mean, they're, they're increasingly fewer percent of the American population. Pretty soon it's going to be like 1%, right? When you get, when the Vietnam vets and so forth and die off. Is America healthcare systems going to like, take a lot of care and attention to like 1% of their patient population or 3%. Really? Do you actually believe that? I mean, people, you know, espouse their love of veterans, but we know that how much lip service that is and, and how little reality is to it. And yet you are a healthcare system where they really need it. And you aren't paying attention to it, you know? You aren't 
using it. I mean, my advice to veterans is every time they say to a veteran calls up and they tell the veteran, you could get an appointment in the private sector. I want to wait. No, I'll wait. Because usually you have to wait longer in the private sector, which they don't tell you. You know, I want to go to the VA, right? Um, and I think that veterans need to start telling veterans that. And I, how to make that happen, I don't know. I really don't. Yeah, it's a part of it is, a, is, a, is an American problem. Right. Of the of you know that we our our lack of intellectual rigor of not wanting to sub, uh, subscribe to any specific bullet points when we say thank you for your service. Right. You know, is that that I you know I, I if, if people I mean it it I don't I don't want to go into the whole thank you for for your service thing, but but just just while I bring it up that the you know it it has no meaning. It has no. I mean it. it and and it does mean something to certain people in that way, and I don't, I don't want to take away away from that um, in that way because vet, some veterans do sacrifice greatly, and that maybe that actually means something to them. Um, but if we're going to be a nation that thanks veterans, if we're going to be a nation that says veterans are our heroes and we want to take care of them, then the first bullet point of that has to be help the VA survive. And that means exactly what you said earlier is like when, a, a, you know, somebody can get in to see their, to see their eye doctor in a couple, a couple weeks, or they can wait a couple weeks longer and they can see the VA. Well, if there's no immediacy to it, go see the VA. And, and at the very least, if you've never gone before, I hope that veterans give it a try. I hope that they, they do try. Now I've had friends that have gotten uh, horrible care from the VA at different times. I feel for them greatly and I talk to them about those things, but the, the reality is, is that those bad experiences, and I've had some myself, they can't keep us from trying to protect the system that protects everybody. And it is, it is the best system that, that veterans have. And you're absolutely right, Suzanne, that we are coming to a point in the next 25 to 30 years where the majority of the Vietnam generation is going to be gone and there's going to be Iraq vets and Afghan vets and other people like that who have legitimate need for this system. And because it wasn't protected when there was that much population, when there was that many people talk about it, who knows what's going to happen at that point? Is it going to become another government boondoggle where the budget is just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and taken away or sent to something that we, we don't agree with or find, uh, displeasurable. So, um, yeah, no, this is an active, this is an active fight. People need to understand that the levels of privatization are, you know, that they could really take giant bites out of what the VA can do out of the good services that the VA can provide. So. And I think the point that you made that this important is if you have a bad experience in the VA, you can call your congressman, you can you know, call your senator, you can have a hearing, you can have an investigation. Mm -hmm. If you have an experience in the private sector, right. there's nothing they can do. They have no influence. All they can do is eliminate that provider from the network. They yeah. can't change the system for the better. I mean, if you look at PTSD, right, with Vietnam vets, it was Vietnam veterans' experiences, hundreds and thousands of them, that Kicking and streaming brought the VA to be the national expert on PTSD for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that pressure, you're going to lose expertise that helps not only veterans, but the entire nation. Because VA research and teaching, it doesn't just, it's not proprietary. It helps everyone. Mm -hmm. And you're going to lose, you know, the information I mean, it was there, it was the fact that they had case after case after case of PTSD, of burn pit exposure, of Agent Orange exposure that allowed them to put it together and figure out, oh, gee, there's something here. If you scatter that information out among 785,000 private sector providers, who's going to put, you know, recognize the, who's going to have pattern recognition? 
and help veterans in the future with the next PTSD, the next toxic exposure. Um, so I think that, you know, I'd love to end on the note of, you know, people need to recognize that every, the VA's budget is based on utilization. If you don't use the VA, the budget allocation is smaller next year. They're going to cut programs. They're going to cut staff. And you're not pretty soon. You know, it's going to be like the frog boiling in the water. There ain't going to be much there left for your cohort or the next cohort. And and we can prevent that. We can expand the VA. We can improve the VA. We can make things better. I mean, that is the history of the VA. You know, it started sort of in the Civil War, right? And, you know, it, it has turned into a very successful, albeit imperfect, healthcare system, but we can perfect it. It'll never be perfect. I mean, there's no human system that is. But I think I'd like to end on the note of, you know, particularly for rural veterans, if you want to solve the problem of rural veterans, the solution is the VA, expanding it, giving it more funds to operate in rural America, and, you know, not pretending that the problems of rural veterans can be uh, solved by outsourcing their care to people that just, like, aren't even there. I mean, it isn't, you know, in urban America, the problem is they don't know how to deal with veterans, and often they won't accept new patients. The problem in rural is America, there ain't, in many, many places, there ain't anybody there to take care of you. And you're, if you threaten the VA, you're threatening some of the only care that veterans have, and that's unacceptable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Suzanne, I think that's a, that's a good place for us to, to wrap it up for today. Yeah. Okay. I mean, do you think this worked well, Henry? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I was going to, I was going to ask you though, that for folks, veteran or non-veteran who want to support the VA, what do you think the best thing they can do with their time is writing to their, is writing to the congressman or their senator, Yeah. um, you know, uh, you know, following following yourself and, and VHPI and it's, it's, it's good work. Um, you know, what are the things that you would suggest, you would yeah. suggest to I pursue think more One of the things that folks could do if they would take the time and it's only a few minutes is if you have a good VA story, call your political representative because all they hear is the bad stories. So call your political representative and tell them the good story. You know, I want to tell and Send it to VH5 because we have a website and, and we're collecting those stories. So that's number one. Tell the stories to your buddies. You know, if they start griping about the VA, say, you know, that's true, but like, wait a minute, what can we do to improve it? If they talk about going to the private sector, you know, talk to them about that. I think that um, you need to have conversations with your legislators. Right. It's, you know, and, and your Congress people are saying, we want more staffing and funding for the VA. We want it in house care, not, you know, in source care, not outsource care. Um, and if you go on to the VHVI website, you'll see, um, um, you'll see um, legislative updates and so forth about what's in Congress. I mean, right now, we have this tester bill, I think it's 2649, S2649, and that should be opposed, you know. Um, they should stop, they should have pilots that expand VA care all over the country, not outsource it, you know. Um, so I think that's, a, and, and you know, it doesn't take very long to reach out to your congressperson or senator. I mean, it literally, you, if you devoted like, every six months, 10 minutes to calling them up and saying, we want to stop the outsourcing. If you use the term privatization, it's problematic because they all say they're against privatization, you know, and, and what they mean by privatization is selling off the VA tomorrow and, you know, closing the whole thing down. They're not against this piecemeal salami strategy privatization of the slow death. And so I think using the term outsourcing care, we want to stop the outsourcing care. You're using, you know, hire more HR people in the VA, 
Stop hiring temps. You know, hire more staff. I mean, they can do it. There are people that want to work in the VA. They're, they want to take care of veterans. They are mission-driven. So I think if, if just, you know, 10% of veterans um, started raising their voices, I mean, veterans are a very powerful political force in American society. And the, the Cokes know this, and they use them against their own interests. And we need to just start telling, you know, the message. I mean, talk to your friends and relatives. Oh, do you use the VA? Oh, the VA is so terrible. Wait a minute. Let me tell you my story. Everyone listening knows 10 people that they could talk to about a good experience with the VA. You know, because you have to, can, you have to counter the bad propaganda that they're pouring millions into creating. And only veterans can do that. Absolutely. Well, those are my those are my suggestions. The uh, the squeaky wheel gets the gets the grease. So we that, that that's how we make that happen. Um, all right, Suzanne. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here today with well, us. Thank you so much, Henry. Money is tight these days for everyone, especially in the lingering shadow of COVID. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim's Everyone Dream, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Ren Jacob, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, Helgeberg, and Howard Reynolds. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and on Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. W.